Hello, and welcome to the Weekly Artifact. This is a tri-weekly podcast created by two friends who met in undergrad and, against all odds, decided to keep talking to each other. I'm your host, Alex, joined always by my co-host, who had the audacity to destroy his windshield 48 hours into me washing it for him. <laughs> Hello, I'm Justin. The internet moves fast. The hot takes of today are less than distant memory by tomorrow. We're here to slow down and recover the content that's been lost along the way in order to make sense of where the world was, where it is, and where it will be. To that end, we've each chosen an artifact from the web to discuss together. Our comments are our own and are not associated with any institution. The show may contain explicit language or themes, so see the show notes for specific content warnings. Justin, what do you got? What's your, what's your artifact this week, bud? So my article this week is from the Paris Review. Uh, it's by Claire Dederer, or Dederer um, and it's called What Do We Do With the Art of Monstrous Men? So the article itself opens up talking about um, different men that, um, for lack of a better word, we might consider to be canceled. Um, and also some that are like a little <laughs> bit older that, you know, people might not be as familiar with or, or at least aren't uh, in like the current sort of conversation. Uh, and it also uh, takes a moment to consider whether there's any women that fall into this category. It proposes maybe Anne Sexton, Joan Crawford, or Sylvia Plath, if we're perhaps counting self-harm. Um, but overall, it's making the point that, you know, it, you would struggle to come up with women to put on this list whereas you can basically go forever with men that uh, could potentially be again for lack of a better word cancelled um so she starts talking about you know her own sort of experience with um essentially this question of separating the art from the artist for example she talks about how the more she researched roman polanski um, the more she became drawn to his films and watched them again and again and sort of like that, you know, even though that, you know, probably not what she quote unquote should be doing, but, um, and then she also mentions like the Cosby show and, you know, are you, even if you do go back and watch the Cosby show, are you, are you watching the Cosby show or are you sort of just at this point reflecting on everything that's happened since and perhaps your own sort of lost innocence in some way. A lot of the article raises various questions. Um, you know, she, she asks like, you know, are we, is this about like voting with our wallets? Um, you know, does it matter if the person is alive and is going to financially benefit is it about something else? You know, can we, uh, she says, uh, if so, is it okay to stream say a Roman Polanski movie for free? Can we um, watch it at a friend's house? And then she's also, uh, I'll, she comes back to this, but she also makes a big deal about like this issue of saying, like, we, then even in that last quote, she starts talking about, like, what do we do? Like, do we vote with our wallets, et cetera? And sort of thinking about, well, you know, when you say we, often we're really talking about I, you know, the, like we're talking about ourselves and trying to like, diffuse some of that responsibility. But that's all sort of in intro to really what she's talking about Woody Allen. She sort of frames it as being this logical versus emotional response, which um, we'll also return to. Yeah, I mean, one of the points she makes is that, you know, she does enjoy certain Woody Allen movies like Annie Hall and you know, she sort of says Annie Hall helps her feel connected to humanity and should she have to give it up just because of what Willie, Woody Allen does? Um, she talks about the dichotomy between ethical thoughts and moral feelings and how we might conflate them or try and frame our um, feelings as being these more um, like ethical, authoritative sort of opinions. Well, one thing I'll, I'll emphasize, too, is that this article came out in 2017, and so a lot of it is um, in the context of this sort of burgeoning Me Too movement slash, like, this um, feminist response to Trump, um, and she, she sort of talks about that, too. And then she spends a lot of time talking about the movie Manhattan, which uh, features Woody Allen's character in a relationship with a high schooler and sort of obviously that parallels his real life relationship with Soon Yi in some ways. Um, and she sort of talks about different reactions to 
the movie and essentially this question of audience response and how you know particularly like certain men would try to have like a more what they would sort of consider an objective response whereas a lot of the women have what um, people might tend to frame as a more emotional response i guess skip closer to the end a little bit She's, she says, quote, the audience thrills to the drama of denouncing the monster, unquote. And she sort of is getting to this point, like, well, why do we sort of like to point out these people that we consider monstrous or that should be canceled? And how in some ways all of us are can be a bit monstrous. And particularly she turns to um, herself as a writer and other writers and how being, uh, but really being any sort of successful artist often involves sort of um, being selfish and sort of pushing away people that are close to you in order to like focus on your work. Um, and particularly for women, often um, gets framed as like sort of like abandoning your children um, in ways that don't really get applied to men as much. She doesn't really come to any solid conclusion necessarily and sort of, you know, draws attention to like whether or not we even sort of want to conflate these different sorts of monstrosities, so to speak. So yeah, so that's the artifact. Um, again, I would say uh, read it for yourself if you get a chance. It's interesting, both in its own right and also, um, I don't know when this episode will come out exactly, but uh, at least right now, sort of cancel culture is back in the news because of J.K. Rowling being transphobic. Uh, hopefully, she'll sue us over that. <laughs> um, but, anyways, but it's, it's interesting in its own right, and also um, as sort of um, you know something that's not just the latest hot take on cancel culture, but something that um, goes back a little bit to maybe give us a, some a different perspective on it. Perhaps I think uh, we've sort of hinted a lot at the separating art from artist conversation before, but I'm not sure we've ever uh, really just hashed it out. I mean, we could potentially start anywhere, but I mean, are there people that you would consider that you would just avoid consuming their, their content or, or are you? Yeah. No. Fucking Woody Allen. Yeah. I, Mostly because I don't like him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's on my list. Although ironically, this article made me more tempted to watch him because she is very like effusive of her praise. Have you seen anything by him? I have not. I don't fucking worry about it. I saw Annie Hall a while ago and it was very okay. I'm like, <laughs> listen, what, like, whatever, maybe it's not my style. Maybe I'm just a fucking punk kid that doesn't know any better anyways. But like the thing was when you were saying how goddamn, how much she simps for Woody Allen, so the line that she has in here that really made my fucking blood boil there's a couple things that i was iffy about but the one was her quote is annie hall is the greatest comic film of the 20th century better than bring up baby even better than caddyshack Caddyshack not that good (laughs) because it acknowledges the irrepressible nihilism that lurks at the center of all comedy this line implies that mel brooks has never made a film in his entire life or that leslie (laughs) nielsen a la the naked gun or the police academy series has never made a film like i don't fucking understand like uh, like (laughs) annie hall's not that goddamn funny it's very okay (laughs) like i just i don't know why she's so hype on and like the other line that like i don't know if this gave you at pause at all but like her because the thing with the monsters is like finishers are the are always monsters because you can just sort of like loosely create on your own time but like it's never gonna you have to like really like sort of like dive in and sort of tunnel vision focus and that's where the monster comes in is sort of blocking everything else away and everybody else away finish quote finishers are always monsters woody allen doesn't just try to make a film a year he tries to put out a film a year that's too much they're not good you can't <laughs> do that you can't do that and you he hasn't if his masterpiece from her words is some people call manhattan from 1979 your masterpiece and you've been making a film a year for the last 30 goddamn years buddy <laughs> and like the polit like the social cost like i know scarlett johansson doesn't give a shit she's an asian tree but like <laughs> Fucking like when he made that last movie or two movies ago with her and some other people in it, and everybody's like, "Well, oh, stop making movies with him." And they're like, "No, it's like I get to make a movie with Woody Allen." Yeah, it's not a good movie, and it's not worth the political cost, like the social cost either. I mean, it is because like nobody actually gets canceled, but like, just why? Ugh, like, 
you got you make got to make Woody Allen's fiftieth movie with him. Like, cool. <laughs> it's basically a commercial. Like I don't like. What are we doing here? <laughs> Yeah, I was definitely thrown off. Yeah, I'm like Caddyshack doesn't leap to my mind as really even in the conversation of greatest comedies of the 20th century. No, it's just one of those movies that like has like people have just sort of liked and it's like fine, but like for whatever reason, they just like they decided to give it staying power. But like it's not. <laughs> it's a very bad movie with like three like okay like famous parts in it but like it's the whole thing is bad yeah the only thing i can think is like it seems like she was trying to say not to say that any hall is the funniest movie ever but just that it is like to her the greatest movie that can also technically be considered a comedy but although even that like i, I don't know it's hard to say like i think with because I haven't seen these movies and I probably will never see any of the Woody Allen movies. I guess the fact that she didn't invoke Mel Brooks, it's like Yeah, right. makes me question like So the thing about Mel Brooks, so he tell me if this line stuck out to you too. When she was like, did her really sort of fucking masturbatory, Am I a monster because this? Am I a monster because of that? I'm not I'm not a killer, I'm not a rapist. I don't know, but I still feel like one. Am I Am I a quote? Am I a monster? I'm not noted for my anti Semitism. <laughs> You're not famous for it. You didn't say you weren't. You're real into Woody Allen, but like, again, didn't, leave, didn't have Mel Brooks in the conversation, so I don't know. Maybe you should be noted for your anti Semitism. <laughs> for what it's worth. For what it's worth. <laughs> Although uh, in Blazing Saddles, Mel Brooks does do red face, so he does. Yeah, yeah. All right, again, he's a monster, Justin. That we get it. All right, they're all <laughs> monsters. Fuck. I, I think I like the article more than I don't, just because it feels like she's trying to be honest, even if some of that honesty comes across as kind of being strange sometimes. I mean, she definitely tries to like sort of confront because she's like oh you know some people will say that i'm like conflating these things and you know i admit that i am or whatever and so you can sort of like say whether or not you think that it makes sense for her to even like take the conversation in that direction in any case i think it does give you something to think about so. well i, I will say, i think we'll give one other critique just related to sort of like the context of the article being what it was which is like where she talks about the women being radicalized. And I think the implication seems to be that they're sort of being radicalized by the Trump election. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, I really don't think the it's you can classify like these Hillary Clinton type women who are mad at Trump <laughs> as being radical. Like there are definitely I'm I don't doubt that there are some women who were radicalized by the Trump election, but to sort of frame the entire sort of Me Too movement as like radical, I think is a painting with a, uh, a very broad brush. Um, a lot, of, a lot not, of swerfy twerfs, even though that is the I don't even though that is the R in <laughs> swerf and turf. I still don't buy it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like I'm not saying that the Me Too movement isn't important, but especially after it gets co-opted by like obviously it started by Trina Burke, and but then it gets co-opted by a lot of white women. And at, at some point, I think it sort of it becomes uh, not radical, even if it's still important in in other mm. ways. So that that's that's one uh, critique that I want to do want to make about it too. But uh, I would actually be remiss now that it, just one thing we don't have to help go into it. But like, she doesn't have a great track record with like depression and like suicide in this article. Her whole thing about like Sylvia Plath, whose self crime was enough. Like, leave me alone. Like, I don't know. Like. <laughs> I don't know, like, you're severely depressed. Like, is that, like, you're a monster now because you, like, killed yourself? I don't know. Eh. I think her point is more so, like, if we were going to consider women to be monsters, it would almost have to be for something like that. Not necessarily that we should. I think you're probably right that she's sort of, you need to paint with a broader swath. But, like, also, I mean, if, well, but if monsters equal selfish in her, which seems to sort of be somewhat, I mean, there's other, there's a lot of ways to be, like, more selfish or less selfish. I mean, like, women can be shitty too. Like, I know, like, the whole, like they have a lot more sort of riding, like, societal pressure riding in them, but, like, I don't know. I think she's a monster because she says, I keep a cozy house. I, I'm attuned to my children. I listen to my husband. I'm respond reasonably kind to my parents. 
an everyday thought I'm a decent enough person, but I may be a monster because I've written a book and I wrote two books and I wrote essays and articles and criticism. I'm a professional author. That's why I'm a monster. Just again, it's real hu- weird, humble brag shit. Man. I don't, <laughs> we did a whole safer about show. Don't tell. And I've yet to be shown <laughs> who else is a big no for me. I mean, well, Kevin Spacey just isn't allowed to make things anyways. Except his annual uh, Christmas video. Well, that's just fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, I probably well, I listened to Louis C.K.'s like fuck like the illegal recording of his new stand up. I might torrent it in like the polished version. Probably not, but maybe. Um, is this to, because that, like you don't want to pay him, or is that? Yeah, I you? okay. So yeah, so where I am is like I really don't have moral qualms about digesting material from monstrous people if I am not subsidizing them in any way. That sort of, I that doesn't matter to me. I, I'm a very, in this immediate instance, I'm very much a voting with your wallet. I kind of take it as recycling and like pollution. Like I will do my part of like putting the glass in the right box and shit, but like I'm not the one that's like making these people, like giving these people the opportunity to make movies. Like I'm not like the person publishing books. Like I am just a consumer as far as like, and I can like, I can sort of try to chisel out like a spot for myself and I can give more time to better people to like do it. But also like it's the big corporations that have to be the ones to make these calls. And I can, the best thing I can do is say, I'm not going to give you money if you do this. I don't know if they'll care or listen or make it a different issue. Like, no, I, the new birth of a nation fell because it was a black movie about black rebellion, not because that the writer director star was an accused rapist, you know, like I, I can't, I'm not going to trust them to like sort of make that decision. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'm willing to spend my time doing like in, engaging with monstrous people's works for the sake of like my own entertainment if I'm not paying for it. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely certain people I try to avoid. I mean, she provides a pretty useful list of people that you might want to avoid <laughs> right at the beginning. Yeah. Um, okay, like, okay, so Richard Wagner, like, I, you can listen to fucking. Flight of the Valkyries, like it's who gives a shit? Like yeah, he's a Nazi, but like so is fucking Sun or so is fucking Fanta and fucking Volkswagen. Like <laughs> you can drive like well, it's not my fault. And he's dead for like two hundred years. Like if you don't want to, like you can't support him or not support him anymore. I guess you can take him out of the conversation of like listing like best composers of all time, but like, eh. yeah. I mean, I guess the argument would go like you know we only have so much mental space to fit yeah. people is like do we want to be have when we think of sort of that era of music do we want wagner to be one of the people or do we want or even do we even want to think about that era as much necessarily or should we focus on some yeah. other music i mean i think that would be the argument there to me like i'm not familiar like he's just not like a figure that i've like thought about enough to be like offended by anything he's done i could imagine like looking into him more and like choosing not to listen to him later but it's also he's also a figure that i just i think i must have listened to wagner i think i took like an opera class i'm pretty sure we listened to some of his stuff but um but i mean it's not someone that i'm like actively like seeking out his music or something so yeah, I think that's the only that's like the only real persuasive argument for me as far as like how I ingest media is that like if I'm giving time to read an Ezra Pound poem, which I don't know what he did, but he's on the list. If, if I'm giving time to that, like I could be giving that to like a less problematic person who is canceled or not canceled. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. The I guess the thing that sort of gives me pause generally about this conversation. And, like, I guess it sort of is shown in her piece is that, like, her term of monster, which I guess you would we would sort of equate to problematic in some way, is... Uh, that, I mean, we, don't, we wouldn't use that word, but... We would, well, okay, so, like, with the art of men who deserve to be canceled, is that, like, I don't know, like, being not a great mom is not the same as, like, being a pedophile rapist and like you don't and you also don't have to fuck your 20 year old common law daughter to make a good movie in 1979 like you like you can still produce things well without being a sociopath 
like there is something to be said about sort of like that tenacity that like the best people have and there is sort of the weight that comes with that like if you want to be like I'm, I'm gonna start conflating if you want to be the best athlete in something you have to dedicate like pretty much all of your time to do that in that field but like you also don't have to like blow up every bridge and like step people in the back while you're doing it you can just like be being selfish with your time is not cancel worthy you know mm -hmm. if you i think if you make the decision to have like children or other people in your life that depend on you and then you also decide hey i'm just gonna do me now like that's shitty but you don't have to do the first half of that yeah i mean i think it raises interesting question about where exactly we want to draw the line like i think we yeah, definitely yeah. can choose to draw the line somewhere i mean i know like one thing i have noticed too is like where the line has, is drawn is definitely different for different people, which oh, I think yeah. is partially what she's getting at too with like yeah. the things people will criticize women versus men mm -hmm. for. But I also yeah. know it's like there's definitely uh, like a racist component as well. Oh yeah, where it's like I feel like a lot of people their first answer for like who do you not consume their content is like R Kelly or whatever. Even though <laughs> I mean like so many yeah. days is like bad but yeah it's like if you want to take down a black woman like there's a lot lower barrier to try and convince people that she said something stupid or offensive mm -hmm. or whatever as opposed to if it's like a white man like even if it's like trump or something people will be like well why is saying that all mexicans are rapists bad or whatever and you have to like, explain <laughs> to them. yeah point being that you we can draw the line somewhere but it just has to be like consistent and has to just be some reason for it i guess Here's my consistent line. No black woman is to be canceled or run out of town before Roxanne Gay is deplatformed. <laughs> <laughs> that includes Candace Owen. I've made this call right now in my head. That's fair. And who better than you to, to make the call on <laughs> the fate of Listen. black women? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's interesting that she talks about like the monstrousness of artists, and obviously she's coming from her own perspective. But I think that also raises some interesting questions about pretty much any job under modern capitalism because it's going to involve some sort of degree of exploitation. And I even think that's sort of related to the what, as of this recording, the current sort of controversy over the the Goya CEO supporting Trump or whatever. Right, it's yeah. like I mean we talked about this off mic as well, but it's like which which of these being companies is not doing something incredibly monstrous? Like just because right. one person says he supports Trump does not mean that these other being companies are like good now. Right, um, uh, and then the other point I think about the sort of um, emotion versus logic divide in sort of scare quotes is. It was kind of an interesting um, question in the way that she frames it, I think. Because she sort of is sincerely interested in like whether there is sort of a value in, I guess, separating the artist from the art and um, sort of trying to view it that way. Or if, you know, sort of the audience response matters. And I, I, I think in general, I'm, I tend to fall on like we should not really separate the artist from the art in a case where it's like Woody Allen is basically making a movie about his life in some way, yeah. or if not about his life, at least about like a very prominent aspect of his life. Like it seems kind of wrong to separate in that case, but in other cases, maybe there could be some, some more value to it. But uh, you know, I just, I just thought that was an interesting question to raise. And uh, I think, yeah, for, I think at the end of the day with this article, feels more about which is a good thing to be about also it's just like the like you said the much higher standard that women are held to before they're sort of described as monstrous even though woody allen still walks the streets making such shitty movies and nobody's calling him out for making shitty movies exclusively <laughs> all right alex that's all for my artifact this week what's your artifact um, my artifact is a Rolling Stones article from uh, 2013 by David Amsden, uh, titled The Brilliant Life and Tragic Death of Aaron Swartz. Um, the article is about sort of the life uh, arrest and the untimely death of Aaron Swartz, who was a sort of famous programmer, um, 
probably most known for being one of the builders of Reddit, sort of bring it to what it is today before when it was in early stages. Um, but he also developed RSS, uh, which is, quote, the now ubiquitous tool allowing users to self-syndicate information online. And so the article just sort of, uh, like I said, it sort of goes through his life and they sort of do a lot of um, just like from like his like very young age to how he sort of got to where he was with Reddit and everything. Um, and I'll just sort of touch on some of that, but mostly going to focus on, you know, the criminal charges brought against him and all that. When Swartz was 19, uh, Reddit was port- purchased um, and he became a millionaire, be- being more and more involved with the um, internet um, culture and sort of the information the author, uh, Amsden writes that, uh, once he made his millions, um, he had become, Swartz had become a tireless and innovative advocate for a number of causes related to politics and the power of unfettered connectivity. Unlike someone like Mark Zuckerberg, who built an online empire by corralling and monetizing private information, Swartz dedicated himself to limiting the amount of power institutions could wield over individuals. In 2011, for instance, he successfully led a campaign to prevent the Stop Online Piracy Act, or SOPA, um, a bill introduced to Congress that would effectively legalize censoring the internet. The same year in 2011 was when he was arrested um, for the charges for uh, allegedly hacking the servers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, to steal millions of files from an online library of academic journals, JSTOR. Um, and the federal government had, in the two years following the arrest, been unrelenting in its quest to ensure that his punishment would be severe. Uh, the case was scheduled to go to trial in April of 2013, and if he lost, Swartz could face up to 35 years in prison. He had been sort of a very outspoken advocate for a free culture movement and the rifts that were being created between the old and new analog and digital um, in 2012, in a keynote speech at the Freedom to Connect conference, Swartz said, there's a battle going on right now, a battle to define everything that happens on the internet in terms of traditional things the law understands. And he asks, is sharing, of, uh, during this speech, he asked, is sharing a video on BitTorrent like shoplifting from a movie store, or is it like loaning a videotape to a friend? Is the freedom to connect like the freedom of speech or like the freedom to murder? Um, he had a his, Swartz had a history of challenging the status quo through an original movement uh, against the powers that be, writes uh, Amsden. In 2008, Swartz wrote a document titled Guerrilla Open Access Manifesto, uh, where he wrote, information is power, but like all power, there are those who want to keep it for themselves. The world's entire scientific and cultural heritage published over centuries in books and journals is increasingly being digitized and locked up by a handful of private corporations. Swartz ended the manifesto with a call to arms, saying, quote, we need to take information wherever it is stored, he wrote, make our copies and share them with the world. In 2010 is sort of when everything happened um those sort of the criminal act happened uh swartz connected a refurbished laptop to mit's terminal to an mit terminal um registered as a guest and signed into jstor which is you know the online for those who don't know jstor is an online library of academic journals that universities pay yearly subscription fees up to tens of thousands of access using a script similar to the uh crawler he used for pacer he downloaded um what would be nearly five million documents over the course of um months up to uh, just shy of a year um and in january of 2011 uh january 6 2011 schwartz uh was surrounded by police and agents from the secret service that july he was indicted on multiple counts including computer and wire fraud uh these charges you know carrying the charges carrying up to 35 years in federal prison carmen ortiz was the u.s attorney overseeing the case and stephen Heyman was the government's prosecutor um and ortiz noted that stealing is stealing whether you use a computer command or a crowbar over the next year and a half um the government ad, would add multiple counts to the original charges and all negotiations um for a plea deal would end in stalemates. The case was set to go to trial in August, um, but in in August of 2013, but in January 11th of that year, 2013, almost exactly two years after his arrest, uh, Swartz took his own life. Daryl Issa, a Republican congressman and chairman of the House Oversight Committee, launched an an investigation into the Justice Department's prosecution of Schwartz and Zoe Lofergan, a Democratic congresswoman from California directed a bill called Aaron's Law to amend the Computer Fraud and Abuse Acts in ways that would limit the scope of future prosecutions against similar crimes. Justin, I know what you sort of want to talk about this, so I'll just sort of let you uh, do your thing. At least from my perspective, I think people uh, are probably most familiar with Reddit, like you said, but I, I feel like when people uh, think of Aaron Swartz, I do think they think of the MIT uh j store thing or at least i don't know i feel like he sort of has uh reappeared in certain spaces for 
uh, that's our freedom of access to mm-hmm. to JSTOR. There's nothing sketchy about downloading something from JSTOR. Um, they just don't want you to uh, share it, which it, whenever you do download something, there's like a little warning that'll be like, you know, you're not allowed to share this or whatever, which I do wonder was that if that came because of this or if that mm. uh, was already there, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think the freedom of information, I mean, I think he's hopefully stays, I mean, a, somewhat of a figurehead of this sort of freedom of information, um, you know, stance. I didn't know about it until I saw somebody sort of tweeting about um, an anniversary of it a while ago. And I just think, I mean, I don't know how many people that use Reddit are like sort of familiar with him and his story. At least just, like, I mean, broadly, I mean, there's so many people that use it, obviously not everybody knows, but I don't think it's, you know, that highly no, I mean, if you sort of, I think like you said, sort of, if you're in the know with sort of that movement, then you know that, you know, the sort of central, I, know, I mean, a, a role that he plays in sort of his memory in there. But there's a lot in the article, too, that I didn't necessarily touch on about, like, his fear of being labeled a felon and sort of the financial and emotional cost of it. I mean, he was, you know, independently wealthy. He was worth uh, at least, like, a couple million dollars by when all this happened. And even that, you know, still wasn't able to... Uh, overcome the sort of dread and exhaustion that he was feeling, the depression that it left him in during the you know ongoing trial and the length of it all. I mean, this was a millionaire on like out on bail for two years, as opposed to somebody that couldn't afford to do something like that. But mm-hmm. I'll let you take it away. I feel like if this article is written today, it would be written differently. But mm-hmm. yeah, the author just seemed not to be aware of. I, just all the privilege, I guess, uh, that Swartz had up to, uh, including this point that he makes, where Swartz literally says, I don't think I have any particular technical skills. I just got a really large head start. And the author just takes that moment to make an editorial to be like, oh, this was false modesty. Yes, 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 yes. (laughs) It's like, like, um, I mean, there is definitely like a balance between like, having a head start and like what do you do with it and like swords definitely seem to like have made the most of his advantages yeah i mean like you're not going to become a computer expert if you don't have access to a computer like or right. whatever so it's like he clearly did have a lot uh you know a lot of different head starts at, but the author like goes out of his way to like try and erase his privilege even when swords himself is like no i was privileged but um <laughs> And there's also just little moments where, oh, this was like a good one too, that kind of shows the dating, where he's trying, to, the author is trying to explain that uh, he says Swartz had been a prodigious reader and writer. And his examples are that he discusses the comedy of Louis C.K. Oh my God. <laughs> well, yeah, it's just all like, his, it was like he discusses the comedy of Louis C.K. and the themes of historian Robert Caro. They talk a lot about David Foster Wallace, but it's literally like every time they try and like, or this author tries to like show that Swartz is like this, like, vaguely intellectual figure it's just like look at all these white men that he like read and <laughs> listened to it's like yeah it's, it's not that impressive like and especially no. now in hindsight it's like it's really not that impressive yeah for sure <laughs> but i think it's all just leads to by uh, the larger point of sort of like what you allude to about the fact that he could even be out on bail but the article also just has this like vibe of like this should never happen to someone who's rich and white. Like (laughs) it's never, the article is never like, isn't it messed up how hard our justice system will crack down on you for the slightest infraction. It's just like, yeah, but can you believe this person who was like, had this much money, like all had to Mm -hmm. face the same thing that like the rabble have to face. Like you didn't say the rabble, (laughs) but there was one part where it said like, The conviction that Swartz was a victim of a government that has in recent years stepped up its pursuit of cyber crimes in ways once reserved for terrorists, where it's like, it's like, oh, yeah, obviously, like, if the government declares you're a terrorist, they can do this to you. But not if you're just a rich person committing cyber crimes. And then even at the end where they pass uh, Aaron's law or whatever, which is like the Democrat congresswoman, uh, 
drafted a bill called Aaron's Law to amend the Computer and Fraud, uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in ways that would limit the scope of future prosecution against similar crimes. But like other crimes, you could still like bring down yeah. the hammer on. But like no, exactly. if a person is yeah. just doing rich person cyber crimes, like that's outrageous. Like, yeah, I think especially with like the whole, I feel like police. Uh, abolition and like related prison abolition is sort of popular right now well who knows what will be popular by the time this episode comes all out all right all right all right <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but there's just no engagement with like no there's like no critique of the justice system in general just sort of like this vague outrage that someone as rich and white as Schwartz would have to face the same punishments that normally go to poor people of color mm-hmm yeah, I mean, it, the fucking three strike law is in full effect right now. Like, there's people in serving life life prison sentences for having an ounce of weed on them three times, allegedly. Mm-hmm. There are bigger fish to fry. Even if the author doesn't appreciate the fact that this is more of a microcosm of the falls, of, the fault, the like, general fault of the criminal justice system, not just cyber crimes. That like I'm. But I think it's important to sort of know that this happened. That you know, they like. Things again, like just things that like aren't even copyrighted, and things like that, like just the <laughs> something about a like the criminal justice system and how it breaks the individual, but also b about how you can be part of the criminal justice system for just wanting people to be able to read articles from three hundred years ago without having to pay for it. Mm-hmm. It's also like a weird cognitive dissonance thing between uh, that Schwartz himself had between like being online and being in person. It, that weird cognitive dissonance of like what was put on a blog, he was surprised and embarrassed. Somebody like mentioned it in a speech introducing him. He was still young, but like, I don't know, just this sort of, maybe because it was so new, but for somebody that the, how some people like don't appreciate how sort of permanent and broad and public online is even somebody that like helped sort of change the landscape forever is uh, just a fascinating like study. I think. Mm-hmm. Even like uh, he had some like just like strange relationships with people and and some of the women. Yeah, there was that one also line for, <laughs> where uh, Larry Lessig was like, "Yeah, he stalked this one girl, but but it was cute." <laughs> oh fuck! That's like another thing where it's like, yeah, if this is written today, it probably oh, wouldn't. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like that. But uh yeah, so you know, whatever I don't know, like I said, who knows whatever everyone's different, but yeah, definitely like some some strange stuff going on in his personal life. But then uh with the disconnect, some of it too is even like with the prison stuff, um where he like doesn't uh want to like imagine himself as a prisoner. Like it's sort of implied that like the idea of going to jail is kinda of, like what maybe like pushed him over the edge towards suicide even more than just like the pressures of the trial is just like not yeah. wanting to think of himself as like a criminal, which is actually what um, Andrew Davis sort of talks about that in our prisons obsolete is kind of like the reason why it's hard to do prison reform sometimes is because everyone doesn't want to think of themselves as a prisoner, pr- prisoner so they don't can't bring themselves to care about it. I think, yeah, and I, I, I'm say, I don't know how much of that was the author's interpretation, but he does sort of talk about a small moment that Swartz had with his girlfriend when they were, like, s- around the White House, and he goes, they don't let felons work there. Like, that's the problem. Both, nobody wants to think of themselves as a felon, but because of just how despised they are throughout society, just on the basis of that title alone, regardless of sort of any other qualifiers. So, I mean, it is, like, whether or not, you know, you should, people should be sympathetic to, you know, every person, including especially felons and, you know, sort of convicts or whatever, um, that like that, like a lot of the hard work is already done of like sort of making people fear that title. And, you know, there's no reason for somebody like Swartz not to like sort of buy into that and think like, yeah, like that's like a really bad part of it. Like, I really don't want to do that. Like that's like the most daunting part is just getting that label and getting that stigma attached to it. That's the the problem with the the felon title is that even if you're surrounded by concrete and metal bars, there's no less safe room than that.
All right, Alex, now that we're in the safe room, what's on your mind? Fuck fireworks, Justin. I hate fireworks. Fucking waste of time, waste of resources, waste of an environment. I, they, they make me mad. I don't need to go sit out on some fucking lawn with a bunch of their yokels uh, <laughs> and a fucking bath towel and some tall, uncut grass or some dry-ass wheat hay because it's the middle of July. The top of July is 100 goddamn degrees because it's global warming anyways. We're just exacerbating the problem with these fucking <laughs> dust bombs in the sky with chemical <laughs> trails, but... <laughs> No, listen. It's just a loud noise and a bright look, and it, ooh, it's fine, whatever. But like, no, like you don't need it. It's just like it's the most. It is the most baseline baby ass entertainment. And I say this coming from I say this coming from the child of somebody who loves fireworks. And I'll never. That'll just. I'll, I'll never be able to make have a meeting of the minds on this one. It just. It's an. It takes way too long. It's a son of a bitch to leave any place after foot parking, like a goddamn sporting event. <laughs> it's the same thing for two goddamn hours. It's just it, like dogs are freaking out. It, fuck, it fucks with the na- like animals in nature because they think the fucking nuclear holocaust is coming. People are getting goddamn PTSD with fucking like vets and shit with explosions. Like who gives? Like what the? F- it's just the dumbest shit. It's just some baby ass shit, and there's no reason. I don't know who did the first one. I just, have you ever seen the video? I think it was like San Diego or somewhere. They accidentally let off all their fireworks at once. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, it's fucking amazing. It's like 35 seconds. This, it literally, like the sun came out. Like the entire place is lit up like bright white. And it's loud and it's this huge thing. And then it's gone. And then it's done. And everybody's like, yeah, that was the best. Of course, that was the best show you've ever been to. Because that's what you care about. It's all there. Once you have to wait for and he's like, oh, ooh, ah. How many goddamn times do I have to hear a 45 year old man with three mortgages say, ooh, ah, sitting next to me? Like, what the fuck? Like, literally, oohs and ahs. I just, I never got it. I didn't even like it when I was a kid. I'm not better than anybody, but kind of. Like, what the fuck? Like, I play video games. I, I like more sophisticated, useless sounds and noises when I do things. But like motherfucker, like it's like there's nothing. You just sit there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you. I mean, you. You halfway swayed me. Uh, you I, like I, fireworks? <laughs> oh my god! I should have known. I can't do this podcast anymore. You ooh, I little piece of. Oh my god! What is your What is your counterpoint? Give me one thing. You fucking infant of a man. <laughs> My current point is fireworks go burr. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Fuck. Oh, we really just became... Oh my god. Uh, okay, I don't really have like a defense of fireworks. I know other... you don't. I could have told you that. <laughs> other than like, they are they're just something to do. <laughs> I mean, so was the genocide, Justin. What are you talking about? <laughs> we have a fireworks show where I am, obviously. They did something even different this year where they had like multiple fireworks shows at once, to, I guess for like social distancing or something. I really didn't think that many people were going to show up at any specific location. And I tried to pick one that I thought was going to be extra empty. And there was still like... Um, probably 200 people in this like mall parking lot but the but the thing was because they were doing multiple shows rather than like one hour long show they did like a bunch of like 15 minute shows which was yeah i don't know if that was better or worse but we so we ended up leaving after like I, it was like 12 to 15 minutes we left after like 10 minutes so it was actually kind of an extra annoying because we had to like i didn't think we were going to like look for a parking spot but we had to like look for a parking spot get out watch for 10 minutes the show wasn't really that good and then we uh <laughs> went back home but still i do like it was still like something to do i, I don't really regret going yeah, uh, listen everybody's bored and depressed i know like, i get it <laughs> capitalism is a fucking plague on the earth and we all need something to do but like motherfucker <laughs> like <sighs> 
so is just throwing fucking broken glass against a wall. Like, it's just, like, it's not good for anybody. But, like, yeah, it makes a fun noise and a bang, like, whiz pow. Like, fuck. <laughs> Sometimes they're in, like, little shapes and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that one was red. The next one will be blue, all right? Like, you don't understand. Sometimes they're white and they're sort of stringy. I mean, I will admit, fireworks are definitely more for kids than... Adults, like after you've seen probably like ten, you know you've seen everything you need to. You see. know, you know, you picked a way too high number. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's two, one to see, and the second one to confirm it's the same thing. Well, the first five you see as a baby, you probably don't remember. Fine. <laughs> then you know you see a couple more, and then I am willing to do anything three times, so I get that. <laughs> but like, fuck. <laughs> Like I mean, are you like you are correct? Like I'm, you know, I don't really have like a defense here. I'm just saying I probably will still go to fireworks <laughs> after this. That's um, fine. Go to fireworks. I'm willing. I'm trying to cox, coax my dog out from underneath my fucking bed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'll go as far as to say fireworks are definitely overrated. Like I will. Ooh, nice. I, I will think that, uh, tie that, that rank into and... another another yeah. safe room. Fireworks are definitely they're they're wildly overrated. They're 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 not that great. They're not worth like if you no one should be filming fireworks. Like no one wants to see. Oh a my film. god! I I even forgot about the filming aspect. My god, is there ever a bigger sound of a goddamn mouth breather? <laughs> they're not even gonna look at it again. Who gives a shit? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of aspects of fireworks I'm against. I guess I'm just being honest with the fact that I probably. <laughs> we'll go. I mean, I wouldn't go by myself. Okay, but here's the thing. Do you? Last question. Do you think anybody would go to fireworks if you needed to pay even five dollars to watch them? No. Well, there. Yes, there would still be people. Who, I would not go, but yes, there would still be. There, people would, there, who, there, there will always be people that pay five dollars for something. But like, you want to clear out a fucking mall parking lot, <laughs> say two dollars, and they're fucking skedaddled. <laughs> Yeah, and I will say too. I would never go to a fireworks show alone. Like, if if everyone else was like, "We'll pass," I would pass, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't really be upset. Everybody said that's baby shit. Like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Put the bib away, <laughs> Justin. What is your strong take? Uh, my take this week is that. Framing yourself as a moderate does not make you an intellectual. And this take is it's not as it's not as fun of a take as the fireworks take. I will I'll be the first to admit that. But it is coming out of some uh, recent events that I can't really give too much detail on. But um I will say the the first and more important one was sort of about um, these what appear to be you know allegedly illegal layoffs of uh, of, of certain faculty at a, at a college, mm-hmm. and there's just I, I think I don't know I, I I don't know exactly what the numbers would shake out as as to who. You know, if you did some sort of poll, the people who went there, like who would support and not support the decision, you know, because it was framed in terms of you know, uh, COVID and but but also just the general financial trends, and mm-hmm. um, so so yeah, I don't know. I, my sense is that more people were against the the cuts than for them, but but in particular, there was just one person that was kind of just you know coming out very strongly in favor of the cuts and uh they just had a post based there's a uh a petition sort of against the cuts and they were just kind of came out hard against that petition um and basically being like you know what choice did the school have you know they had to do these cuts uh you know despite the fact that you know all the people at the top of the school make way more than anyone who got cut and, but just being like, you know, like, let's not be hasty. Let's not make any too drastic of moves or whatever. And just the mm-hmm. people in the comments that are just like, oh, this is so eloquent, like, well put, well put, you know, whatever. And it's like, no, like, just because you're sort of, like, framing yourself as, like, more moderate than this petition, like, you're advocating for, like, a bunch of people to become unemployed, 
in order to protect like a few wealthy administrators. Like that's not like an eloquent position. That's just, <laughs> that's just like a completely immoral position. And like, no one should be praising it just because it sounds like it's like measured and nuanced or something. And then like a very sort of similar thing where um, I ended up listening to this podcast. Uh, I, w- I won't say the name of, and someone just kind of being like, oh, you know, like this is like the content that I've needed, like that I've been looking for, whatever. And like the podcast was <laughs> was basically just like, you know, oh, I'm tired of, uh, you know, all like the both both extremes of, of our discourse. And like, you know, I just want to provide like an objective view and, and stuff. And yeah, it's just like, what, like, no, that doesn't make you like, like there's no reason to get hype over someone being like I have no ethics or morals. <laughs> I just look at two people talking and try and like squeeze in between them. Like that's not like an interesting, smart, nuanced, clever view or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And I just don't. But I, I just feel like you see that a lot. Where anytime someone like frames themselves as being like above the fray or something, <laughs> people will just start like clamoring on, being like, "Oh, this person is so thoughtful and intelligent," yeah. or whatever. It's like, no, they they just stand for nothing. Like, right. And like, I think when I when I hear moderate, I also just like think centrist. And like, I think people also conflate not picking a side as being like the nuanced position which people like really that's like a real good word to like describe yourself as but again you're just like not making a call like oh listen there's you know both sides and like so people like who are centrist think that they're like i'm not political i'm a centrist like that's not like actually like a literal political position anyways because you like agree with like i think mostly things that conservatives say are right but i also like gay marriage like you're you're still a conservative like you get just because mm-hmm. like you're like you one thing doesn't make you a centrist it's physically conservative socially liberal whoever that fucking crock of shit is mm-hmm. like that shit we're like no like listen like i what is the least i can say to still sound like i'm saying the most things right now mm-hmm. just yeah it's just no one <laughs> no one no one cares about you saying nothing i mean like again like like you said people just want to get pat on the back for making no commitment to anything <laughs> still act like they're sort of there's no risk at all but give me the reward please <laughs> yeah and it's always just like the problem with it too is there's no sort of attempt to contextualize like what you're trying to like position yourself in the middle of it's like no it's like oh uh you know even even if you like go like gay marriage it's like oh one side says uh gay people should have like the same rights as everyone and the other side says they should have no rights but i'll just like fit in the middle of this like that's not really like <laughs> A, I mean, there's not really like a middle to be had there. Like you, they no. either have equal rights or they don't. But right. B, it's just like okay, it's not like one side is saying like let's take away straight people's rights, and the other side is saying let's take away gay people's rights. It's like no, right. one side is already the middle position. Like <laughs> you can't then just like squeeze yourself again into the middle of it. It's like, right. even, even with that, like, you know, the petition I referenced earlier, it's like, it's not like the, the petition was basically saying, like, to remove, like, certain administrators. It wasn't saying, like, put them in prison or something like that. <laughs> like, it's already, like, a pretty moderate position. It's like, oh, this person did a bad job. Maybe they shouldn't have that job that they did a right. bad job at doing. But Jeez. But, like, no more punishment beyond that versus, like, the other side being, like, Oh, some people did nothing wrong. They should be come unemployed. Like that is the much more extreme uh, position. Like so, yeah. there's no wiggling your way out of it. Like you, if you consider yourself a moderate or a centrist, you're just a baby. You're just like you're. Well, no, you're not a baby. I'm sorry, you're a coward. Let me rephrase. This. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely yeah, like you said, there's no political imagination, or I guess just generally no imagination to this type of person that it's like you you, there's nothing saying that you have to put yourself in the middle you could also just do something completely different too if you're if you really don't like you know the the, what you consider to be the two options even though there's always more than two options anyway the idea that there's even two options to put yourself in the middle of is strange it's like there's like many many different opinions on like any issue but in any case yeah like there's no like the idea that the only thing you can do is put yourself in the middle rather than like come up with your own thought is also just kind of strange. 
as always, fireworks are for babies. Moderation is for moderation is for cowards. <laughs> it's settled. Settled. <laughs> All right, that's our show for this week. See the show notes for a link to view the artifact for yourself, as well as the end notes. Music is uh, produced by Nicholas Pizzuto. Rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Facebook. And tell a friend or enemy about the show. And join us again in three weeks as we find two new texts to discuss. And she just decided to fly to Cincinnati because the flights were so cheap because this was happening. <laughs> and I thought that. I'm just looking at her. I'm just like, fuck, really? Like, really? And then I remembered again... That one day I came to class and she was looking real disheveled or whatever. And I was talking with the other class, like, yeah, how's it going? Like, rough weekend or whatever. Like, I didn't even say that. She was just like, that's been a rough weekend. I was like, oh, what's up? She's like, well, I couldn't find my fucking car this morning. And I was like, what do you mean you couldn't find it? Like, was it stolen? She's like, no, I couldn't remember where I parked it. And I was like, what do you mean you couldn't remember where you parked it? And she's like, well, after I drove home from that party, like, I don't, I like just woke up and I don't know what happened. I was like, what? And then she was looking at me like, I was the asshole for like, either A, not connecting those dots earlier or being like, I don't know, taken aback that she was blackout drunk driving, that she couldn't even remember where she fucking parked her car. <laughs> and then I told that to Ryan. He's like, oh, I didn't hear that one, but I heard about her asking her boss at her law firm for Coke. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I gotta start going to these parties. He goes, no, she just said that to the in the law library in front of everybody. I was like, what? <laughs>